Hello everybody and welcome to Vaidya's Chess Hub. In today's lecture, we are going to cover the three variations of the Nimzo Indian defense for the black side. So as you know, we have covered the Zemist variation and the classical Queen C2 Nimzo Indian. So in today's lecture, we will look at the 4E3, which is another popular main line known as the Rubinstein variation of the Nimzo Indian defense, uh, named after, of course, the famous player Akiba Rubinstein. The 4F3 variation, which is uh, very trendy if we want to play for win from white side, many players are using it. There is no particular name given to that variation, uh, it's just known as the 4F3. The thing about 4E3 and 4F3 is that they may transpose into the Zemist variation. So later on when white will play A3 and we will take on C3, we will transpose to Zemist variation. So white at each point will have some options uh, at his disposal, whether he wants to continue playing the new system or whether he wants to go back to the Zemist variation. And there is the 4 bishop g5 variation, which is the Leningrad variation of the Nimzo Indian. Now, you all know that Leningrad uh, is a city and uh, there were some grandmasters from that city who were playing this variation continuously. And that's why it's named as the Leningrad variation of the Nimzo Indian. One of the players who uses it regularly uh, from white side was uh, actually Boris Pasky, the former, former world champion. And uh, yeah, there are a couple of games uh, of him in that line. So let's start with the Rubinstein variation, which is the old and classical line. So d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, and now bishop to b4. Uh, just to revise once again, uh, white has other moves like knight f3 and g3 which are also possibilities and they are also big chapters but when white plays the move knight to c3 we can play the Nimzo Indian with the move bishop to b4 and now the Zemist was a3 and queen c2 was the line in the previous two videos so let's start with the move e3 now it's a pretty simple move as you can see uh, white just uh, makes a pawn move just to develop his bishop to d3 and plays knight to f3 or e2 depending uh, on his uh, choice and then plans to just castle shot. So he is not uh, putting pressure against this bishop on b4. When we saw the move a3 or queen b3 for example, there is one move which really tests uh, the presence of this bishop on b4. But the move e3 is uh, not challenging this bishop immediately so we don't need to take immediately as well. Since we are not yet uh, attacked by anything, we can just continue development. And now there are a couple of options for black at this point. He can play the move c5 is a one line, d5 is a one line, knight e4 is also one of the lines. Also castles is possible. Like these options are there. But we are going to continue uh, playing it in a simple way by playing the move b6. Which anyway we have to play in all the other lines as well because... Uh, the anyways the main strategic idea of the nimzo indian is that whenever we double this pawns we have we want to have this plan of playing bishops a6 and followed by knight c6 knight a5 this is important plan against like uh, for example uh, white can play the move a3 and suddenly we will be in the same variation the, that's the case with the f3 as well so if white plays a3 then we will be suddenly in in the Zemist variation. So we have to keep in mind that what do we want to play against this system. So against e3 we are playing the move b6 and now white has actually uh, three main moves in this position. He can play the move knight f3, he can play the move bishop d3 or he has an in interesting try with the move knight g2. These three options are there. Now let's uh, look at each of them. Let's start with the move uh, knight g2 which is a uh, bit unorthodox so look, let's look at that line first bishop d3 and knight f3 these moves look normal so we will also cover it so the idea of knight g2 is that uh, as with the queen c2 the idea of knight g2 is protecting this knight on c3 so at any point the bishop decides to give itself for this knight on c3 white does not want to create a double pawn but he will recapture with this knight and keeping the pawn structure healthy so how do we respond to this move knight g2 See, one thing is there that whenever white plays the this kind of queen's gambit uh, type setup, whenever there is a pawn on c4 in Nimzo Indian, we uh, attack it. So in this uh, in this line, actually, also there are some alternatives like uh, bishop a6 is one of the moves that we are going to learn. But there are alternatives as well. You can play c5 or d5, but this is the most principled move. So we are immediately targeting the pawn on a6. And now we are giving uh, white a choice. So a3 is uh, the most uh, typical response. Another way to play is to play the move knight g3. 
Now after knight g3, we want to exploit uh, this diagonal. So we want to play d5. But d5 immediately tactically does not work because then queen a4 check would happen and then this bishop would be lost. So we have to keep this tactic in mind whenever we want to play d5. We should always watch out for this diagonal. So what we can do instead is that we can take on c3 first and then play the move d5. And whenever this exchanges will happen, we first will take on f1 and then we will take on d5. And then the plan is very simple. We will just castle, we will play c5. The rook will come to c8 and the c3 pawn will be targeted and black just has very comfortable position here. Another move uh, other than uh, 6a3 as we, we just discussed this move knight g3 bishop takes c3 uh, b takes c3 d5. Now after d5 he doesn't have to take on d5 he also has another interesting try with the move bishop to a3 just stopping black from castling here. So in this case as well, we just take on c4 and then after e4, uh, black has this position uh, where he is completely fine. So one idea could be just to play knight d7 and c5. Notice that if he just goes for the pawn exchange, queen a4 uh, for just grabbing the pawn, then we can just play queen d7. And after queen takes c4, we have queen c6. This is a typical idea in Nimzo Indian and then you have a fine position and let's say if white gets ambitious here and goes for a checkmate threat then we simply have the move knight d5 and suddenly we will be winning here because queen takes c3 is a checkmate threat not checkmate threat we have defended the checkmate threat and queen takes c3 is actually a winning threat because the resulting end game would be just winning for black because of uh, the simply the extra pawn and the better pawn structure so these are some of the uh, lines that are possible after this sixth move knight to g3 but let's look, let's look at 6a3 now. We have discussed uh, some options uh, with the move, with this move right now. So if white plays the move 6a3, then we have to... Uh, then we can also play bishop e7, that is possible. But we, we just take on c3 and this is the point of white's play, of course. He wants to take on c3 with the knight. And now we can play d5 once again successfully. The point is same. So if cd5 is played, then we just take on f1 and then take on d5. It's important to take with the knight because since we don't have any light square bishop problem here, we don't want to get into this structure with our pawn on uh, d5. Uh, this structure is pretty good on the king side and knight takes d5 and something like this would result in just a fine position for black. Black has no problems whatsoever in this structure. So. Uh, knight takes c3 d5 and now he doesn't have to take on d5 he should play the move b3 and now white has the two bishops here so he has uh, a playable position but black's position is also fine black can just castle here and after something like bishop e2 you can already commit a structure with knight c6 and now uh, you will have the plan of knight a5 once again targeting this weak pawn on c4 for example after castle knight a5 uh, black is very comfortable here with attack on his pawn and then he will develop normally with queen d7 and bringing his rook to the central files he just has perfectly normal position so this uh, was about the sixth move uh, sorry the fifth move knight g2 so in the let's just to revise we are looking at the 4e3 line we are playing the move b6 and now at this point i had told you that there are three moves knight g2 bishop d3 and knight f3 so uh, these three moves are there and we just looked at the move knight to e2 where we are supposed to play bishop uh, a6 and then eventually we should get in d5 and then our position is uh, fine in the following line. Okay, so now let's go to the next line which is the most natural move actually knight to f3 or bishop to d3. Against both of the both of these moves, let's say against bishop to d3. Now we don't put our bishop on a6 this time because since there is another target on this diagonal. So we put our bishop on b7. Uh, attacking the pawn on g2. Now there is very interesting uh, gambit possibility here. For example, uh, white can play the move knight to e2, sacrificing this pawn on g2 and there have been some lines with uh, this kind of play. Now black takes on g2, rook to g1 is usually played and now bishop to f3. This is the point of black's play. He pins down both the knights here and black is very comfortable. We are going to look at one of the games where uh, black uh, has played this line and managed to get a winning end game quite effortlessly and his opponent just resigned in a in a position where there was uh, equal material but still the position was just dead lost. So uh, rook takes g7. The line might continue like this. Bishop c3, bc3 and now knight h5 
and now this rook on g7 is having some problems he has to go all the way back to g1 and then after queen h4 you can see that already black spaces are quite nice here the queen is active attacking h2 and then black's position is completely fine he might even castle uh, long in the long run so his position is totally fine here so bishop d3 uh, bishop b7 and now knight g2 was the interesting possibility that we just looked at there now apart from knight g2 there are normal moves also in this position like you can play the move knight f3 that is the main line uh, you can also play the sixth move f3 now f3 is not really a good move and uh, six uh, knight f3 will usually transpose to the line with five knight f3 so knight f3 we will also play bishop b7 and then white will go bishop d3 and we will be back to the same position so against the move f3 uh, we punish this move immediately by playing the move c5 now this is the typical reaction whenever white plays the move f3 in the names of indian you have to remember this thing whenever white goes for f3 his idea is to continue with the move e4 he wants to play e4 gaining the perfect center so as a black player you should not be uh, sitting there just uh, not doing anything you should react aggressively otherwise your position will get cramped and that is the essence of this position that whenever he plays f3 you, you should break the center immediately the point of c5 is that uh, we are stopping e4 because of course the d4 pawn is hanging and let's say if he uh, plays knight g e2 then after cd4 and ed4 this pawn on f3 does not make any sense because it's not no longer supporting the advance e4 and that's the reason this c5 move is the principal reply which uh, immediately causes some effect in the center and why it has to be accurate here hence this uh, sixth move f3 is in fact uh, not that good move in this particular position you should play a move like knight f3 and now we just castle uh, white castles and anyways we play c5 challenging the center and after bishop d2 we can again play this position where uh, black is completely fine this will result in a position that uh, will be familiar to most of you who play uh, c3 variation of the sicilian alapin it's a typical isolated uh, queen pawn position like for example after afterwards we will take on d5 with the bishop or even with the queen and then this pawn on d4 we call it the isolated pawn and this position is typical you, it can result from karokan as well from sicilian as well and yeah you can uh, play this position from both the sides actually it's a great experience so this was the move six knight f3 uh, where castles castles at c5 is played and after uh, now bishop d2 is not really a principal move a3 is a possibility but then we can just exchange and then we play the move bishop e4 notice that we don't want to allow e4 in any circumstance or uh, something like d5 as well so white might prepare e4 here with the moves like queen c2 and stop us from getting a counter against it see whenever we have exchange on c3 white has the c pawn that can come to d4 so our c5 now lacks in strength a little bit so we have to be accurate here and we do that by playing the move bishop to e4 just stopping all the counter play there is also interesting try in this position after c5 white can play the move knight a4 and now the point is he is trying to uh, annoy our bishop here without getting a double pawn so we have to take here and after a3 we can just simply retreat and the line goes like this uh, where you will set up a hedgehog position now this is something new for you so what is a hedgehog a hedgehog is when all the pieces are developed up to only third rank and you might get it from the sicilian scavenging variation as well uh, you can try looking for it like in the taimono as well you get it sometimes uh, this uh, hedgehog setup where you put your uh, rook on c8 next you will play bishop f8 g6 bishop g7 and you will wait for white to uh, decide on his plan and then you will break out eventually it's a typical play in the sicilian defense so you will get a hedgehog structure in this particular case so this was about the move uh, 5 bishop d3 where we play bishop b7 and after this knight f3 we just castle and then break out with c5 and then we have to play this isolated pawn position so this was i think a long uh, theoretical video about this line now uh, we will look at some of the games uh, in this particular variation but this uh, was only the theory in this line this is one of the most uh, popular systems for both the sides actually which have been analyzed uh, uh, up to almost move 24 or 26 there is actually a funny story about this line about the rubinstein variation 
Peter Leko and Anatoly Karpo are the two great exponents of this line from the black side. And uh, there are a couple of sacrifices that are even analyzed up to move 20 or 24. So what happened to Peter Leko once? Uh, he was uh, faced this. He was facing this line with uh, some player. I don't remember his name exactly. But then the sack on e6 came. Uh, like this position that we have on the board is a typical isolated queen queen pawn position and white if he can generate some attacking chances then the position might become great for him and there was one game where rook takes e6 uh, happened and leko lost uh, with the black pieces uh, quite a painful game and then uh, leko had said in one of his uh, interviews actually that uh, he felt so bad that he lost that game then he checked he went through and uh, checked this game so thoroughly that he had analyzed the game up to almost 28 moves and he got actually chance to play against uh, Sokolo, who is one of the players who play from white side this. So you can check the games of Ivan Sokolo from white in the Rubinstein variation. He plays this isolated queen pawn positions and uh, he, go he unfortunately faced Leko. And when Leko had prepared almost 28 moves of theory, uh, the game was decided basically. So uh, Ivan Sokolo just went into the Leko's preparation and... On the 28th move, Leko had uh, found one novelty which he had already prepared at home and Sokolo was playing over the board. So this is about the Nimzo Indian. The logic is there. It's a classical opening. It depends on uh, how much theoretically prepared you are and I think this is the best uh, system against uh, the d4 and it's also clear why all the players are playing it. So uh, let's look at one of the games now. Now this is the game of from the uh, Gibraltar Masters 2005 between uh, Ali versus uh, Chris Ward. Now, Chris Ward is a, a GM from uh, England. So, let's look at this game uh, from the Blacks' perspective. <clears throat> so, d4, uh, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, bishop b4, e3, b6, bishop d3 line. And now we already know once uh, bishop is put on d3, we put our bishop on this diagonal. So bishop b7, knight g2, that interesting gambit line uh, was tried in this game, bishop 2 f3. And now instead of capturing the pawn, uh, white thought that he should gain a tempo over this bishop. So he played rook g3. And now uh, when there is a still pin alive here, uh, black first made sure that he creates a double pawn in the position. And then he retreated with the move bishop to e4. See, again, uh, stopping e4 at any cost is uh, always a priority. So, bishop was went to e4 here. Queen c2. So, white insisted on getting this uh, e4 square. Now, ex some exchanges happened. And now, g6. And now, you can see that black structure is so flexible. Like, in fact, this position, uh, the pieces are equal. The Everything is basically equal here. But only difference is white structure is little weak. And black has perfectly healthy structure here with his bones. So even in this position, uh, black is absolutely fine. There is no problem. Even though white gets in e4, black just plays d6. And after bishop g5, he plays h6. Now this is uh, an interesting move. Because white played the move rook h3 here. Making the use of the fact that hg5 is not possible because of uh, rook h8. So rook h7 was played. You can look at black strategy. He's just uh, staying solid and not giving, uh, not creating any weaknesses in the position. Although this was uh, a pawn sacrifice after knight h5, bishop went back to d2. Now he played the move knight c6. But now you can see it's difficult for white to get any break. Uh, for example, he can't move the knight uh, because sometimes f4 square might come under attack. He can't push d5 because the knight e5 would hit the queen and this sensitive pawn on c4. If he tries to get in e5, there are already two defenders for uh, this pawn. So it's difficult for white to uh, create a plan. So white goes for f4 here, going for the perfect pawn center. And now black just keeps on developing with the move queen d7. And he is planning to castle long here. So f5 was played by white. And now you can see after long castling, uh, it is very difficult for white to actually create an attack. Like even if after c5, let's say something like queen a6, even if white queen gets there, uh, it's not really threatening anything. The reason is that this bishop is a, a bad bishop behind this pawn chains. This knight re doesn't really have any active squares in the position. So uh, f takes g6 was uh, played here. Knight f4 tactic would never work because after knight takes f4, the queen will be attacked. So you can't ch challenge this. Uh, rook on h7 so fg was played f takes g6 and now rook to b1 now i was wondering what happens if castle 
Now, after castle, actually, black's attack will come even faster. See, it's all because of the pawn structures. White pawn structure is weak, black pawn structure is healthy. That's why white can't create attack, but black has a great attacking potential. His queen can come to a4, and you can see black's bishop is a terrible, white's bishop is a terrible piece. He can't do anything, and uh, black will get a great attack after queen a4, knight c4. Then there will be some queen a3 check ideas with almost uh, checkmate threats. So uh, black's attack would be faster. So castling is not a good idea here. So that's why white played rook b1, hoping to get some c5, queen a6, and trying to create some threats. So, but black just played rook f8, and now you can see black also has some counterplay here since the white king is uh, stuck in the center. Now uh, what happens if uh, now in the game white played rook f3, but what happens if c5? Then we can just take on c5, and after d c5 we can just exchange the queen. So there is uh, no time to attack basically you can see queen a6 doesn't really create any threat we can just go king b8 and after that even if he uh, gets in this capture then as well uh, it's not going to be uh, it's not going to damage anything in fact black is very quick here to start an attack with something like rook f7 and with the threats of rook f1 uh, black is pretty fine here so c5 and the line might go like this where uh, actually after knight f3 and rook d7, you can see because of this weakened pawns, the pieces are also not functioning well. They are pushed to the defense and after something like this, uh, black already stands better here because the knights are superior to these pieces and he is also a uh, pawn up in the position. So black has absolutely no problems. So after rook f8, rook f3 was played, challenging on the open file. When, since there is only one open file, it's good uh, to challenge it. Now some exchanges happened. Now there was a mate threat of a queen to f1 and it would be checkmate. So that was uh, defended by white by playing the move king to d1. Still queen f2 happened and now he's just threatening to capture all these pawns. So this is a threat. So queen h3 was played. And now king b7, just making sure that uh, the uh, pawn on e6 is not hanging with check. Because uh, black is not really worried about losing this pawn on e6. Because then uh, his attack on the king side might become strong. Like there is a, there would be a threat of queen d1 and then followed by rook f2 uh, coming into the position. So pawn on e6 is not that much of a worry. But uh, not it should not come with a check there. So that black wouldn't have to lose the time. And also king on b7 is pretty healthy piece. So that his king position is secure. So bishop e3 was tried, then rook f3. Actually, there were other options as well at this point, but rook f3. And you can see just after two moves, after rook h4, white in fact resigned the game. This uh, Now look at this position. Both sides uh, have equal pawns. That is, both sides have six pawns. Both sides have equal material. And... White just can't defend this pawn on e4, and that's why he resigned. And even if he pushes with something like e5, he will lose the pawn on e5. And basically, whenever black will get to this c4 pawn, this c3 pawn is also weak. And because of only the structural weaknesses that white has here, he just decided to resign the game. Because black's play is so easy, yeah, it's a uh, debatable question whether you should resign in such positions or not. But it's a grandmaster game, and... Uh, White player just resigned in this position because look, you can look at all his pieces. They are tied to defense of something which is not that important. So pieces are not functioning well. If you look at black's uh, uh, pieces, they are all aggressive. This knight is coming to a5 from where it, it will hit the c4 pawn. This e4 pawn is currently a target and uh, black will just uh, attack all the weaknesses and pick it up in the long run. So he just decided to resign the game here. Uh, it's of course uh, so very early to resign, but still the black's position is uh, much much better here. So we are concerned with the opening here, and black managed to equalize this uh, pawn sacrifice idea quite nicely here by timely uh, creating a double pawns, then stopping e4, and then getting this uh, healthy structure, and by uh, making some solid moves uh, like queen d7 and long castle, he just uh, got. A very very nice position and eventually just the f file um, basically decided the game and when once the queen was in the position was in long term was winning so this is the difference between a e4 game and a d4 game like in a e4 game uh, when do you say the game is decisive we say it when we have at least the material advantage or when the black when once king is in trouble but you can see the uh, grandmaster game of uh, between these two guys 
where the material is equal, uh, the king is not under attack, but still white resigned here. And uh, such examples have happened in Nimzo Indian, where it's just the positional domination that black has created in this position, just makes white resign even in equal position. Now, this is not, uh, this is also one of the examples, but there are many such examples of such things where just the structural weaknesses, like they, they are not falling uh, with some instant tactic as they would in E4. But in the long run, uh, white is just going to lose uh, all of these pawns and then black is going to win a game. So this game was the perfect illustration of it. Now, let's look at the next game. Now, D4, Knight F6. Now, this is a game between... Uh, Jan Timan and Victor Korshnoi. Actually, no, this game is this game is not in the Nimzo Indian, so some another opening. Okay. Now this is actually the game of Timan again, uh, but this time he's uh, playing against Paul Borsma from the Netherlands uh, tournament in 1981. This is uh, Jan Timan is playing with the black pieces, and let's look at this game now. So d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, bishop b4, e3, b6, knight g2, bishop a6. Now you can see in the previous video we had seen bishop d3, bishop b7 and then knight g2 which was the pawn sacrifice on g2 but this time white plays this fifth moon knight g2 which is another uh, interesting sideline and we go for the fisher variation now with the move bishop to a6 immediately hitting the pawn on c4 so a3 was played bishop c3 knight c3 d5 this is all the theory that we have learned uh, in the first uh, in the first section of the video b3 and now in this game timon just decides to castle note that we are not worried about cd5 at any point because bishop f1 is going to destroy white's castle rights so bishop e2 was played knight c6 a4 we are still not worried about this because bishop e2 would now hit the queen so white would have to take back and then we just take back with the knight with a completely fine position so a4 was played in order to get in a5 uh, sometimes see white's chances to create some majority here he will eventually play bishop a3 b4 with the ideas of b5 so queen d7 was played just uh, making the connecting the rooks and then the rooks would be brought to the central files Bishop b2, knight a5, typical idea in Nimzo Indian to create a weakness on the c4 square. And this is also a typical idea to block out this bishop on a6. White have often has this try. And this is an interesting way to defend this pawn. For example, black is threatening currently this and then bishop takes c4, let's say, winning a pawn. And there's always this kind of defense where white first blocks out this uh, bishop. Now, we don't really want to take this because then... Uh, white can take with the c pawn as well and then the pawn on c7 would be a backward pawn and then he can just double his rooks and create the pressure along the c file and this pawns on a4, a4 and b5 they cramp our pawns so after knight b5 c6 knight a3 was played and this is interesting way to defend this pawn on c4 now queen e7 was played bishop c3 trying to get in b4 so rook b8 and now, if you take on a5 here, black just uh, takes on a5 and he just got a, uh, a semi-open file for his rook. After cd5, he will first exchange and then just play ed5. And this knight is coming to e4 from there, maybe to c3. There is a weakness on b3 and black's position is just totally fine. He can even play rook b4, rook b8, queen d6 eventually. And this knight doesn't really have any good squares, while black's pieces just function superbly here. So queen c2 was played in the game and after dc4, knight c4, couple of exchanges happened there and black plays c5. Now this is very important whenever you can uh, fix this weakness on the c4 you should do that since d5 will lose a pawn now. So c5 is well timed here. So a5 was tried trying to open up the a file for the rook b5 immediately closing uh, the file. And now a couple of exchanges uh, happened along the b file and you can see if this pawn becomes a passed pawn then that will become an asset but of course the position is uh, level at this point and now black needs some careful moves to equalize here because this bishop in the long range long range make it uh, activated like he might put his bishop on a1 at some point and uh, then have some chances along this long diagonal so black made some precise moves attacking the pawn on a6 bishop a5 and now rook c8 queen c4 h6 so just just in case uh, giving a space for uh, his king uh, we call it a luft so h6 was played uh, for that reason 
rook b7 and now here uh, black made an interesting choice he played knight e7 and after g3 he took on d4 queen d4 and played queen takes a6 he saw that after rook takes e7 he is getting back uh, the piece on a5 and after rook takes a5 now this is a critical position actually black played rook c1 king g king g2 and queen b5 and you can see this is move number 32 and of course the position is uh, level there is the material is equal the pieces are equal but still uh, put yourself into white shoes and uh, think of a white move here what would you do here from white side because if you see uh, even though the pieces are level black queen is threatening to come down to this square so you should calculate the consequence of this check followed by queen h1 check and there can be some mating nets here so what move would you play here from white side this is an interesting uh, situation i think where you can put yourself for test so uh, we'll see what happened in the game so uh, In the game, rook a8 check happened. The clean way, I guess, is to play queen d8 check and after king h8 to play rook takes f7. And now the point is after this checks, uh, king g4, uh, rook c4, the rook is able to block the check. This is the point of taking the pawn on f7. And uh, yeah, then the uh, white is completely fine here. And if you go something like h5, then after king h3, uh, so we are not uh, interested in taking the pawn, although it would be also fine, I think. But king h3 is just safer and uh, black should not over push in uh, this particular situation. For example, after king f3, king h4, white is very comfortable here. There is no mating net because there is a pin also along this diagonal. And white king also is, uh, black king also is not completely safe. So uh, black clearly should not over push. So in this position actually, after queen b5, in the game rook a8 check was played. And now it became interesting. So king h7. And now again, I think you can pause the video and have a think. What would you do here with white pieces? Now, this is very tough, I think, to find out in an actual game. Because there's an amazing move, uh, the only move that saves the game for white. If you try something like queen e4, then after f5 and something like queen a4, then uh, this is a possible line where queen h1, king f4 and queen takes h2 will happen. And now there are just too many threats. Queen takes f2 is a threat and eventually taking all these pawns and black has an easy win. So in the game, rook a4 was played. And now first let's, let us look at the game, what happened. Queen f1 check happened, king f3, queen h1 check, king f4. Queen takes h2. Now white thought that he has this move, but turned out that there is f5 in fact, which is very powerful. And after queen e6, there is queen takes f2 check. And it is close to move 40, so there must be time pressure. And after king e5, uh, the same thing happened, which I just explained. Black just took all the pawns. And here, in fact, after rook c5, white just resigned the game because he's losing the queen here. Uh, there's no way to uh, defend this against this check uh, without losing a queen and the game was decided so you can see even in equal position black had just created a slight threat here so it's not related to anything to opening we are now already into end game but after getting a fine position and that is the reason you know many times people say that oh nimzo indian is equalizing opening it's not that uh, aggressive or attacking like uh, kings indian or something or dutch or some other openings like this but see whenever uh, your position is equal it doesn't mean that the position is dead you can still play on it, play it on, and uh, your opponent might miss something in uh, the later future as well, as uh, White did here. And he lost the equal position. But the draw is fantastic here. After rook 8, king h7, the only move that makes a draw is rook a7. Now, you will ask why. So, this is the point. Queen f1, king h f3, queen h1, king f4, and after queen takes h2, there is amazing resource here actually. Queen d3 check is possible. Now f5 is the only move. And now white has this sacrifice. Rook takes g7 check. And it turns out that because of this king on f4 actually, you have a perpetual check here with queen d7. And then it's just a perpetual. You can't escape from it. If, uh, if you try to risk it by going to h5, you will actually lose the game. So don't do that. So it's just a perpetual on this uh, three ranks. By just putting your queens on d7, e6 and just all these three squares, the black, black 
queen is just black king is just can't escape from this perpetual check so this was a fantastic resource that in this position after queen b5 rook a8 king h7 rook instead of rook a4 rook a7 is in fact the only way you could have defended this position it's important to see that this rook g7 just is a perpetual check and that's not something uh, easy to calculate uh, especially when you are in time trouble so uh, yeah this was the way to save the game now let us go to the next game so this is the next game between Shakriya or Mamed Yaro playing with the white pieces against uh, a Kopian playing with the black pieces and now it's again the Nimzo Indian e3 variation and this knight g2 system so we again play the move bishop to a6 here and after a3 bishop c3 knight c3 we play the move d5 immediately exploiting uh, this spin along the c5 now b3 and this time again uh, black goes for the simple uh, plan here just castling and then exchanging and after here uh, white decided to play rook b1 he could have played bc4 but then there would have followed knight a5 this typical move to attack this pawn and after c5 uh, with just exchange and by exchanging on c5 uh, black would have had this knight b3 regaining the pawn and black would have a fine position here as well so this was the point of akopian's play so in the game after d c4 rook to b1 was played so queen d7 uh, note that black can't take this pawn because there is a pin along this diagonal so this pawn can't be captured so black's plan is simple he's just going to play queen d7 and put his rooks in the center so a4 rook f d8 b4 now there is a fork so rook bishop b7 was played and now bishop to a3 uh, trying to get this pawn to b5 as well as opening this diagonal for the bishop so a6 was played and now queen to c1 and now this timely move e5 now this is very important note that at this at the exact point when the white queen left the d file black immediately broke with the move e5 and this is the move that usually all the semi slav or nimzo indian players they want to uh, make uh, basically many in many openings this move frees up the position and creates a tension in the center uh, making use of the fact that white can't play the move d5 here since he can be captured just with the knight so uh, d5 was anyways played here knight e7 and now usually whenever such structure arise when the, the pawn is getting attacked couple of times uh, black's position is just healthy here and this type of structure is not what white wants because the pawns are on the same color as uh, the, his bishop and hence this bishop is a bad bishop yes black's bishop is uh, also not doing that great but he has this two knights that have potential of coming to the king side so let's look at this black immediately broke this uh, pawn structure with the move c6 and now mamedero went for interesting complications here he played the move b5 uh, he could have simply exchanged, still black keeps the advantage because this knight is now coming to the d4 square. For example, after b5, knight d4, the square is great for this knight and after bishop b2, there is already a tactic in the position. So, there are many moves actually that are better for black but he can simply take on e4. This is one of the tactic uh, because the knight is overloaded here and the knight can't take the bishop since knight e2 is a, a, a great fork so that's the tactical detail here and when once this pawn falls then uh, it's very difficult for white to recover because then the king side is also a little weak here and black gets very easy play so note that in this positional opening as well there are always tactics in the positional play as well without tactics as we know chess is 99 percent tactics so you can't live without tactics uh, in any opening basically okay so bishop takes uh, in the game after c6 b5 was interesting try by uh, mamed yaro trying to complicate the position now a b5 and now rook to d1 now this is the point of uh, mamed yaro's play he wants to put his rook uh, next to the queen and try to complicate the position but now simply c d5 rook b5 and d4 so his he sacrifices the pawn on b6 uh, this knight can't be taken because of the pin but this knight just headed to this f4 square which is a great square and now you can see once this e4 pawn falls the attack is just going to be too strong here so queen to b1 was played an interesting move hitting the bishop so bishop a6 and now g3 just uh, preventing this knight from jumping anywhere here 
queen to e8 was played, stepping out of the pin. So now d takes c3 is a threat. And now here, uh, actually, the position is very difficult. Like if you try to move this knight somewhere, then uh, bishop takes b5 would happen. And now you, uh, if you take with the rook, there are a couple of things that are hanging. Rook takes a4 is uh, the obvious. So for example, let's say after queen b5, queen b5, now a b5, then this uh, a3 bishop is falling. So rook b5 and now d3. And now after that, simply the e4 pawn is uh, falling if bishop goes to f1. And if you go to f3 with the bishop, then rook takes a4. And then these two pawns, uh, you can see that the material, uh, this black just simply has this two extra pawns and just a winning position with the rook uh, beautifully placed behind the pass pawns. And white's bishops are not doing anything. So this is clearly winning position. So after queen e8 in the game, rook takes a6 was interesting try by Mami Daru, trying to complicate it, but it doesn't help after bishop c4 is simply retreated. And eventually, uh, I guess this moves were played in time pressure, uh, black lost an exchange, but then this queen a7 move made sure that he's attacking two pieces. And after queen c2, he uses another tactic of overloading here. So again, the queen... In the game, bishop c1 was played, but if queen e4, then of course there would, would have been queen a4 hitting the rook as well, as well as the bishop. So yeah, and these two pawns are basically uh, going to win black the game. So that's why in the game after knight e4, uh, bishop c1 was there, but it's now simply the pawn rolls d3, bishop e3, and now even a slight calculation here by dc2, rook d8, knight f8, and after bishop takes c2, queen c7. This is a final double attack in the position that decides the game for. Uh, White here, white would have to resign here. So in the game, bishop c1 was played. I think it might be uh, like they might be setting up the board again for the next game for like it must be a digity board and knight bishop c1 was played. But anyway, this is the final move, queen c7 that uh, wins the game for black since it's a simple double attack and black is going to win the material. So in this game, you can see that black's position was so solid in the opening if you see after uh, this dubious uh, pawn push which was b5 black just got pretty healthy pawns and these three pawns you don't usually get them from the uh, black side white can sometimes get it by sacrificing something but without sacrificing anything if you get such a pawns then usually that's a bad news and that's the power of the this opening simply it's uh, white has to be accurate he can't play a uh, uh, like anyway and just get an equal position uh, there are always tactics uh, in such positions as well so yeah that was i think a good example uh, in the nimzo indian now let's uh, look at some another line now okay this game this next game is actually really fascinating so we'll look at that game now Okay, so this is the game of uh, Bobby Fischer playing with the black pieces. And, you know, to be honest, uh, when I first uh, started playing the Nimzo Indian from black side, uh, I thought that this opening is so boring. I, because, I, as you all know, I am a Kings Indian player. So, I also play Kings Indian. But I also like principled openings, like, for example, uh, Taimano variation. Or sometimes I also like to play E4, E5, uh, some uh, Ray Lopez lines. I basically like sometimes the principal chess that's why I play e4 as well myself and I also play d4 so I like both of these openings so once uh, I saw Bobby Fischer doing it from the black side if Bobby Fischer is playing the Nimzo Indian defense then there must be something that he is liking and this game completely changed my attitude towards the Nimzo Indian then I realized that it's not really a passive opening or anything it's a great positional opening that requires a great understanding and uh, this game is really inspiring I think uh, you now we are going to look at so Bobby Fischer is playing from the black side and Bobby Fischer is the one who says that e4 is best by test right so when he plays an opening like Rimzo Indian he really likes it uh, so d4 knight f6 c4 e6 the same line of the Rubinstein variation these moves are fairly known to you so I, I won't go into detail this is the position we have already seen in the third time we are seeing it today so again all these uh, moves are logical b5 was a double attack so knight e7 knight ed5 and we'll actually jump to the critical position of this game so both sides are still developing you can see that black has a fairly comfortable position his pieces are well placed here the queen went to c7 connecting the rooks so rook a d8 was played rook fd1 bishop goes back to b7 since it's not doing on a6 uh, it's not doing anything on a6 it retreated 
and now white played rook d2 white will eventually try to get in e4 somehow without losing his d4 pawn currently if he plays e4 i think knight f4 is a bit of an issue this knight would sink into the d4 d3 square and then we call it an octopus knight as uh, we know from the previous example the c4 pawn black has got kind of a slough defense structure uh, here so rook d2 was played and now uh, already knight takes c3 and now c5 so this is the timing of fisher's play so fisher is a, a player like this shows the how a style can influence an opening play so fisher as we know is a great tactical player and he finds tactics in uh, in this position as well in the so, such a static position he plays the move c5 the point is after bishop takes b7 he has this a uh, tempo to destroy the center and then take on b7 creating a weakness on d4 so c5 shows great tactical awareness just uh, hitting this thing so in the game dc5 was played and now he destroys the pawn structure and then uh, exchanges and simply grabs the control of the d file and then puts his rook on d3 so that the queen can also join the d file so bishop b2 knight d5 and now after bishop c3 he plays f6 and e5 so this formation when the bishop is hitting the pawn structure like this we call it biting the granite like this bishop is not doing anything the pawns on f6 and e5 are completely uh, shutting off the white bishop on c1 so king g2 was played now queen d7 and now rook c2 and after rook c2 uh, fisher found a great trick here now this shows again the eye of a tactical genius uh, i would advise you to pause the video after the move rook c2 try to find the best move for black here what would you do here from black side So black has a, a really nice uh, tactical move here that opens up the position for him. So what did Fisher play in this position? You can see just by uh, the last move rook c2 white has created some issue in the position. There is some issue and black immediately found a solution. I hope you have found a move as well. Fisher played the move e4 here and such a nice breakthrough in the position. Uh, in the game rook to c1 was played. Now you can see that rook to c2, this move looks completely natural, right? Why it is just uh, making a rook move or maybe he is uh, going to exchange the rooks here on the d2. That was his plan. But uh, Fish against Fisher, you can't play a casual move like this because uh, he's always calculating something and he's always looking forward to attack on the king. And e4 is exactly doing that thing. So in the game, rook c1 was played back, uh, respecting, giving respect to Fisher's calculation here. The point is after fe4, queen g4 check would follow and rook d1 is coming next. So just this move, rook c2 created just a slight weakness on the back rank and Fisher immediately goes for this weakness. Now if you play king f1, then there is knight takes e3, which is a nice trick in fact. Because uh, after rook d1, uh, he doesn't even want to lose this knight. So knight takes e3 is a nice way to uh, get the same kind of material uh, and after f e3 he can go rook d1 he can also play queen f3 first making this rook even more passive and then go for rook d1 that is also possibility uh, like there is also uh, i think a line like this possible like rook f2 queen h1 king e2 and now rook takes e3 even winning even more material in the position and then uh, this position is just uh, terrible for white since you are losing everything here so you can see this e4 move is such a well-timed move uh, and after uh, he f e4 queen g4 king h1 also does not work since we can just take on e4 we can also play rook d1 which wins the queen but we can even take this uh, uh, pawn first and then after queen g4 rook d1 um, we are still winning here so in the game after e4 rook to c1 was played and now e takes f3 check was played now king to h1 and now once the pawn gets to f3 we already know from the patterns of lolly's mate and other mates that once this pawn is on f3 it's not a pawn it's worth a piece so uh, here as well you can't take the pawn because there would follow king h3 and then same tactic again knight takes e3 uh, the point is pretty clear that after f3 rook e3 would uh, pick up the queen also there might be some checkmate ideas as well i think uh, like queen g2 queen f2 rook d2 checks is also possible there are just number of ideas black anyway has the winning position uh, in all the cases so king h1 was played and now fisher continues the tactical operations knight takes b4 so winning yet another pawn using the back rank threats now 
Now, if you take on b4, then we can go rook d1 check. Now, if you take, it's of course mate because of the usual back rank problems. And after rook d1, queen e1 is the only move. And now we can take the queen, but we can be even more nasty by playing the move queen g4, threatening the mate here. And after queen g1, uh, we still can keep this pin alive and just go for queen g2 mate, which is, I think, the stylish mate. You can also play queen take g1, which is also mate, but queen g2 is just gets the style points okay so uh, this uh, all this evaluation change happened because of this white's casual move rook c2 and against a man like fisher you can't relax and this e4 immediately punished him and out of a nimzo indian you can see how he has created a king's indian like attack so uh, he just won a pawn and then the conversion was very much efficient here so g5 just making sure that uh, he doesn't get anything by the way in this position uh, white can take on f3 but Fisher in Fisher is also a scientific player. So whenever he can clarify the position, he is not interested in always checkmating the king. After queen f3, he would have just played queen d5, which would have forced the exchange. And then the pawn on c5 is falling. And when he sees that, uh, okay, this position is just hopelessly lost, you can sacrifice your pawn on f3. You don't have to checkmate the king uh, always. This position is just easily winning. That's why after rook d4, white didn't even take the pawn on f3. He just played rook g1 hitting g7 so g5 was played c6 and now this is just uh i don't know how many pawns up it is it is four pawns up for black so of course fisher stabilized his position and then started pushing his majority and then eventually uh, this is not even required i think uh, but still he went for this tactical complications and then he's just couple of pawns up here he's four pawns up still in the position he's now five pawns up and uh, with attack so basically uh, they continued for a couple more moves and then after queen g6 check here white decided to resign because after king f2 it would be checkmate to the white queen queen g8 and then uh, white would have to exchange the queens and the uh, resulting pawn in game is uh, very easy to calculate okay so this was i think fisher's masterpiece uh, in this particular line now let's go through the two uh, other games that we are going to look at. Now we have covered the entire Rubinstein variation and we have looked at all the different lines there. So uh, there are two minor variations like one of them is the F3 variation of the uh, Nimzo Indian. So going here now after Bishop B4 White can play the move F3. The idea is to get the perfect pawn center with E4. So we of course stop it by playing D5 and after A3. This is the only case where we don't take on c3. We, we can, but we just put the bishop back to e7. Since we have to respond this e4 move with takes, takes and e5. Now this is the point. There is also, if you know the fantasy variation of the Karokan, which is uh, uh, like this, e4, c6, d4, d5, f3. Here also black has this option of uh, exchanging queens. We are going for a similar one here. Of course, white would not take on e5 because then knight g4 and then this is a threat this is a threat and black just gets immediate equality so this is the point of uh black's play and after d5 bishop c5 knight f3 bishop g4 we pin down the knight and this is very simple i think this is this uh, you can play without with your own understanding because this is very similar to e4 e5 positions the bishops are good the knight is good and just after some simple moves, uh, black will be able to equalize this position. Now, the only challenge is if white, uh, white castles long, but uh, black has an instructive plan in this particular case, which is knight e8, knight d6, creating a blockade for the spawn on d5 so that this knight remains passive. And it would be a double edged fight where black has this plan of putting the bishop to d4 and bringing a knight to c5, and black just has uh, immediate equality. The only thing you have to remember in this line is this f3 creates a threat of e4 and we have to play d5 here. We can also play c5 which is another line but d5 is uh, one of the lines and we can just play this move e5 and then get the bishop to c5 and then the position is fairly normal. You develop normally your knight to d7 short castle and so on. Yeah so position is I think very simple for black to play. So we will look at one of the games uh, in this system. Now this is a short game only just lasted 20 moves. So uh, it's the Nimzo Indian F3 variation. This is all been seen just now. So I will not comment it on that. This is all main line play Bishop G4. Now in this game Queen A4 check interesting line was tried. Black continued developing and white thought that he's, he has this target. But you have to remember that white has broken here a very important opening rule which is uh, grabbing a free pawn in the opening. Uh, even though it's a center pawn, you should not do it uh, 
like if there is no risk you should only grab it now this move is just in fact uh, i can say that even it's a losing move because black played simply castles now uh, bishop knight take d7 bishop take d7 was played if you take on g4 then after knight g4 there is knight f2 threat there is bishop f2 threat there is queen h4 threat just a lot of threats uh, like knight f2 rook g1 and f5 and you can just see that white king is not going to find shelter anywhere and after ef5 just queen h4 and there are too many things hanging in the position also the rook is coming to e8 i think this position uh, i can leave it up to here because the white king is just going to get uh, mated here so bishop take d7 was played in the game after knight d7 bishop d7 queen c2 knight g4 again with the same threat queen h4 g3 and now bishop f2 check and bishop take g3 using a little tactic here which is a typical one uh, white anyways went for this complications but after queen d3 black played a great move to open up the position uh, i think you can pause the video and have a think how would you open up the position here from the black side <coughs> Yes, black played demo f5 and after king c2, f4, knight e4, rook a to e8, white just resigned the game. Because you can see that the knight is this here, bishop is coming to f5, e4 knight is going to get under tremendous pressure here. And there are basically no moves that uh, white can make in this position. This knight is currently hanging and it's uh, even if you move it to something like c3, then bishop f5 follows creating the pin and that's the game so this is this line f3 variation uh, carries a lot of risk for white but it's also trendy line you need to uh, look at it in the detail and now uh, i think we are left with one more game which is uh, in this line called as the bishop g5 which is the leningrad variation there is actually one game in the leningrad variation which i uh, i had analyzed but i i can't keep this that one in the video because that is one of the tals game against spassky you can check it out in the leningrad variation and that is so complicated that only that game i think would take around an hour to analyze so i have not decided to put that game here but you can check it out so this is one of the uh, game of Victor Korshnoi playing with the white pieces and this is the Leningrad variation when white goes for the counter pin. Now if you are uh, someone who like to play the Ragozin variation you can just play the move d5 and you have a Ragozin here. But there is an interesting gambit possibility that I am going to recommend you in this video which is c5. Uh, a typical Benoni like strike and after d5 uh, h6 bishop h4 usually you can also start with h6 this is another way to get it this is usual way in fact after h6 bishop h4 you go c5 and after d5 uh, as in this position we have this interesting gambit which is the b5 line known as the Auerbach variation of the Nimzo Indian defense which you can use against this uh, bishop g5 system so e4 is the typical way and d6 and black structure is like a Benoni defense here. So let's look at what this game what happened. So queen c2 castle. Now this is another line where you can see basically in the Nimzo Indian by making too many moves on the queen side. Black white keeps his king in the center. So uh, what black does black uh, tries to open up the position immediately as he did there here. And now already in this position you can see there are a lot of factors. There, there is this pin, there is rook c8 coming, there is rook e8 coming putting the pressure on the e4 pawn. So black's piece play is just very easy here. And in the game after g5, bishop g3. Now if you take on a5 then you just take on h4 and after something like uh, knight, uh, knight e2 let's say we, we can just take on e4. The point is after queen e4 we have queen takes a5 check. And the line like this would just end uh, badly for white, right? We just retreat our bishop and now the three heavy pieces are going to uh, take down the three uh, open files here and it would be just a disaster for white. So in the game, bishop to g3 was played, uh, rook c8, bfi, rook takes c3. You can see white king is still stuck in the center and now knight takes c4. And now just look at the black's domination in the center here. That basically tells the story of the position. Queen d4, queen a5 was played with some nasty discovered ideas. So queen e4 would be met with rook c4, I think, winning the queen. So queen b4 was tried and even in an endgame, white's king is not safe here. So rook e3 check, king d1, bishop b3, king c1, rook c8 and then yeah, 
white played black played knight d2 here and the game uh, was over but there is a, actually a powerful move in this position i think uh, you can pause the video and have a thing and yes i think this is the uh, last uh, video uh, of the nimzo indian series uh, nimzo indian is in itself is quite a big uh, chapter so there it would take a, a lot of time but these are the main lines that's we, uh, there are five lines total we have looked at they are the critical variations of the nimzo indian so uh, i think we can uh, end this uh, video here with a nice puzzle for you guys this is black to play and black has a very interesting move at this point that he can make here so you can see the point is we, we want to give a discover check but the king is running to a4 so the great move here is uh, instead of knight d2 the move rook to d2 now it's impossible for white to get rid of this bishop d1 check a nice uh, discover check that would end the game and the bishop along this diagonal would also cover this a4 square so this rook d2 is would have been minus uh, nice final touch that would have ended the game for uh for the white okay so black would have won uh quite easily after the rook d2 so yeah this is the uh we'll stop here for today okay and uh, we have covered the Nimzo Indian in quite a great depth. See the structure. This is actually one of those opening. Uh, if you yeah, since you are only studying e4, this is one of the openings where there are options at each point for black side. For example, if you play something like Sicilian Dragon or uh, any Sicilian, basically black moves are sometimes very forced. You have to uh, walk along a narrow line just to equalize the position. But Nimzo Indian is such a broad opening that you can have a lot of plans, you can have a lot of options as we have seen in previous some cases that there are four to five options available at each point for the black side and he can choose from them uh, as per his style. But the strategy remains the same. He tries to play against the double pawn if he can create it. And yeah, the play usually uh, is more based on the, uh, the pawn structure rather than uh, the piece play it is based on the piece play if white decides to go for aggressive lines like this bishop g5 or f3 variations we have seen some great king hunts and again if you are a tactical player you you can create a tactical play out of any position as uh, fisher did in that game where he played e4 and managed to open up the position so yeah that was it uh, for the nimzo indian okay take care bye bye